Good afternoon, members of the media, our live viewing and listening public on CIG television, our YouTube channel, as well as Radio Cayman. Thank you all for joining us here this afternoon, including other guests, for this press conference on the cruise berthing and cargo facility as it relates to the preferred bidder. I'd like to first, to, I'd like to first begin by introducing our Honorable Premier, the Honorable Alda McLaughlin. Seated to his left is our Deputy Premier, the Honorable Moses Kirkernel. And seated to Mr. Colonel's left, we have the Chief Officer for the Ministry of District Administration, Tourism, and Transport, Mr. Strand Bodden. To Mr. Bodden's left, we have Mr. Peter Ranger, Chief Project Manager of Major Projects Office at the Public Works Department. And to his left, we have Mr. Jason Robinson, the Senior Manager at KPMG. To the right of our Premier, we have, or to the left of our Premier, from your viewship, we have Mr. Norman Klein, a partner at Appleby, and to his <coughs> left, we have Mr. Will Jacobs, the acting port director. Welcome to everyone. Thank you. We now open the floor to our honorable premier. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for joining us today for what is a highly significant milestone for the future of these beloved Cayman Islands. As I promised in the House on Friday, when formally announcing the selection of the preferred bidder, we are now able to provide the country with more details of the cruise and cargo dock project, a project that secures the future of Cayman's cruise tourism industry and protects the well-being of the thousands of Caymanians who benefit directly or indirectly from cruise tourism. I would also like to acknowledge and thank those members of the Government Caucus who have taken time out of their busy schedules to be here with us today. The winning bid received from the preferred bidder contained three options, which Cabinet was able to consider. The differences in the three bids essentially involved the extent to which new cargo dock facilities would be improved as part of the project. Having regard to the concerns that have been voiced about the project, while looking to secure long-term benefits for the country, the Cabinet selected the option that minimizes the environmental impact and delivers the best overall financial deal for the country. The established cost for the selected option will be less than 200 million Cayman Islands dollars, subject to the final contract negotiations. The Deputy Premier and Chief Officer Strand Borden will provide details of this option and the financial arrangement in a few minutes. As I stated on Friday, Vernon Isle Port Partners, the winning bidder, consists of McAlpine Cayman Limited, Orion Marine Construction, Carnival Corporation, and Royal Caribbean Cruises Limited. All of those involved are trusted world-class companies, and all have had a Cayman connection for decades. As I mentioned on Friday, Orion Marine Construction purchased Meisner Marine Construction, which is the company that previously built the Royal Watler Cruise Terminal, as well as the Creek Dock in Cayman Brack. This is a moment that the majority of the people in our islands have been aiming to get to for at least 20 years. Certainly every government elected since 2000 has had promises of a cruise port in their election manifesto or as part of their delivery plans. It is the hard work done by the last two administrations that means we are now, finally, able to announce that we are in a position to proceed with the delivery of the new port facilities this country needs for the future. When we took office in 2013, we set out on a complex process that we knew was necessary to bring us to this point. It was at a press conference like this on the 28th of October 2015 that I, the Deputy Premier and Chief Officer Borden, announced to the country that Cabinet had carefully considered the various professional reports on the project and had agreed the previous day to move the cruise berthing facility forward. This included starting conversations on a workable financing model, conversations that included independent legal and accounting experts, 
the major cruise lines, the United Kingdom government, as well as government officials. It has taken almost four years to achieve what we have today, a unique financial structure that does not expose the finances of the country to any risk, a cruise berthing facility with no one single major cruise company controlling it, but instead one that will be managed and owned by the Port Authority on behalf of the people of the Cayman Islands. Enhanced cargo port facilities, no new upland development other than to modernize the existing facilities, a final design that significantly reduces the environmental impact of the project, building it in deeper water as well as relocating coral. A financial model that binds the cruise lines to the long-term delivery of the port. A project structure that has ensured that at every stage along the way, we have followed the strict requirements of the public management and finance law and the framework for fiscal responsibility. And finally, announcing today, the preferred bidder, along with the other information that we promised would be made available at this juncture. During this process, we have been unable to say very much, but the process took as long as was needed to ensure that we arrived at the best outcome without any political interference. And this we have done. I accept that our inability to answer questions definitively up until now has been frustrating. It has been frustrating for us in government as well and as frustrating for the thousands of Caymanians who support the project, just as it has been frustrating for those who oppose the project. Many Caymanians have had perfectly legitimate concerns and questions that government was simply unable to address while the procurement process was on the way. Perhaps inevitably, over the past year in particular, government has been bombarded from various quarters, including by some media platforms, with a plethora of questions that we could not discuss till the process was completed. However, as we always promised that as soon as we were able to do so, we would answer the questions people have had, and that is what we will do today. We explained over and over why that simply could not happen before now. Put simply, this is a design, build, finance, and maintain procurement. That meant we could not show the country the port design because it was for the bidders to propose the final design. We could not discuss the final financing of the project because it was for the bidders to come back with their proposed financing model. Yet, despite the explanations we provided, there are those who were determined to prevent the port project proceeding and who took advantage of our inability to comment fully to put forward several unfounded allegations that were just wrong. Indeed, some would say they were downright untruths. Sadly, those proponents of untruth, notably Cayman News Service, and some of the leaders of the CPR group were not content with casting doubt on the project, but they also threw in for good measure allegations of corruption on the part of elected members of government with supposedly secret deals having been made, particularly with China Harbor Engineering. This continued even after I announced the preferred bidder on Friday, with CNS noting that supposedly, and I'm quoting, the other finalist bidder was China Harbor Engineering Company, which many people thought would secure the deal because they had been prepared to offer financing to government for projects beyond the Georgetown Harbor cruise pairs and cargo port expansion, unquote. I do not know who the many people are that CNS highlighted, but I can say that I suspect the reality is that if any such people do exist, then it is a limited number who thrive on conspiracy theories. In any event, they and CNS are wrong, very wrong. There were no secret deals with anyone. 
And we have never been in discussions for anything other than the port project itself. While there have been a small number of opponents who were willing to do or say anything to cast doubt over this project, most Caymanians who have expressed their concerns or asked questions have done so for perfectly understandable reasons. They are concerned that if the country is to embark on this project, then we must get it right. The right design, the right costs, and the right balance between the economic benefits and the inevitable environmental impact. I am pleased that we are now in a position to answer those legitimate questions and to put to rest the concerns people have. In short, I am confident the chosen bid option gets it right. By the end of today's press conference, I am hopeful that those parts of the media that are challenged in getting the facts right will now report factually what has been said here today and what is being done to move this project forward. In recent days, another question has been raised to challenge the validity of the procurement <coughs> process, this time by the leader of the opposition. As I said earlier, it was the Central Tenders Committee that approved the tender. The question then arises as to why Central Tenders Committee, as to why Central Tenders Committee, when the new Procurement Law 2018, 2016 calls for major government projects to be dealt with by a new body, the Procurement Committee. The reason for this is very simple. The Procurement Law 2016 only applies to projects that were not started when the law came into force. Specifically, Section 21, subsection 1 of the Procurement Law states that the law will apply to every procurement project being carried out that has not been started when the law comes into force. The new procurement law came into force on the 1st of May 2018. The project started some years prior to this date, but certainly the procurement process started in 2017. Independent legal advice was taken, and the guidance provided was that the procurement law did not apply to this project, nor did the Public Procurement Committee have jurisdiction to deal with it. Prior to the new law, the Central Tenders Committee formally dealt with all matters relating to projects of this size, and did in fact deal with this project in previous years, aspects of this project in previous years. It was thus the Central Tenders Committee that could adjudicate on this project. On the basis of the independent legal advice, Cabinet appointed the current members of the Central Procurement Committee to a reconstituted Central Tenders Committee. And this has allowed the procurement of the project to continue legally. I do hope that that explanation will put this particular issue to rest. I will, I will resume uh, my, my comments and remarks when the, after the Deputy Leader, the Deputy Premier speaks and the presentation has been made. And I will then address the issue of the people-initiated referendum and government stance with respect to that. But I think for the sake of um, coherence and cohesion, it is probably best that I now ask the Deputy Premier to um, address in more detail the project, after which we'll call on Chief Officer Strandborden to actually do um, a presentation with respect to the, the details. Deputy Premier Moses Colonel. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Premier. A very pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for being here. The Premier has provided a great deal of information about the preferred bidder, Verdant Isle Port Partners, and also about the procurement process that has been followed. Those are two very significant points, and I think it bears repeating that the preferred bidder comprises a consortium made up of a trusted developer that is a household name in our islands. In collaboration with cruise lines 
who have been our partners in the cruise industry for decades. The consortium also includes Orion Marine Construction, formerly Meisner Marine, who have previously worked on the port in Georgetown Harbor and in Cayman Brac. So needless to say, they're very familiar with the Cayman Islands and the marine environment. Understandably, the potential impact to the environment has been a cause of concern because of our natural environment is integral to the viability of our tourism product. As a responsible government, we made a commitment from the outset of this project that we would ensure any plan that was approved would be built in a way that minimizes the environmental impact while delivering the greatest benefit to our people and to this country. I believe we have delivered on those commitments. The footprint of the new pier design is more environmentally friendly than the 2015 schematic submitted for environmental impact assessment. The new design has the piers pushed into deeper water, which means we will do less dredging, less coral relocation, and there will be no dredging in Hogstye Bay. The facility still consists of two finger piers which will be resting on pilings to allow the sea and marine life to move freely underneath. Pilings are commonly used all over the world in the construction of piers and bridges situated over water. So the method is tried and tested. Over 20 years ago, a very similar dock was built in Cayman Brac on the north side open to the elements and has certainly stood the test of time. Additionally, the proposed cruise berthing facility will not increase the likelihood of flooding in the area to the north and south of the new development. Wave walls have been incorporated within the footprint of the design which will further reduce potential flooding and wave overtopping onto the road during extreme weather conditions and will add more protection to the central Georgetown area. As the Premier has said, the cruise berthing project has taken six years to arrive at this point. At various stages in the process, I have repeatedly said that it was necessary to arrive at this stage in order to have factual information in hand regarding the design and cost of the project available to all. I am now very pleased that not only can we show the proposed berthing facility design, we can share more detailed information regarding the costs and the affordability, which has also been an area of concern and speculation. The successful bid establishes a cost for the project to be in the range of $200 million. This includes the enhancement of the cargo port. This cost is in keeping with the budget estimate produced by the consultant team and is roughly half of what opponents to the project have claimed. Had we not needed to upgrade the cargo port, the cost to provide the country with a first-class berthing facility would have been reduced again. But our port is 40 years old and operates under conditions that are cramped, inefficient, and less than ideal. Simply put, it needs to be upgraded to be able to handle the higher volume of cargo we need to provide for our growing country. If the berthing project did not proceed, the Port Authority would require capital investment to upgrade the cargo area because it would still need to be done. The difference is that cost would be met by the public purse instead of a new revenue stream from cruise arrivals. So speaking about costs, the berthing facility is being financed by the preferred bidder. Their investment will be repaid over a 25-year period from cruise passenger fees. Passenger fees are bundled into the cost of a cruise, much the same way passenger taxes are bundled into the cost of an airline ticket. The portion of the fee which currently pays for tendering services will be used instead to repay the preferred bidder for financing construction of the berthing facility. The share of the existing passenger fee currently paid to the Port Authority and the Environmental Protection Fund 
will remain unchanged. After 25 years, the investment has been repaid. That portion of the passenger fee will be remitted to the Port Authority, increasing the revenue that PACI receives per passenger. And as been said many times, the Port Authority will continue to operate and manage the cargo port as well as the new cruise terminal, and there will be no increased upland development. This means cruise lines will not own or operate any retail or commercial space within the cruise terminal from the inception of the project. Government has maintained that Georgetown is our upland development to ensure that money cruise passengers spend while onshore continue to provide the maximum benefit to the local economy. I'd like to say a few words about job security and creation. The reason this country needs a birthing facility is to make our cruise tourism industry sustainable into the future. We have a great cruise product and we have to provide the ability for it to grow and to continue providing jobs and opportunity for our people and our young people. I've been asked that while those jobs I have been asked, what will those jobs be? In short, they will be the same types of jobs that support the cruise industry today, only more of them. With more cruise passengers, there will be a need for more entrepreneurs, more taxis, more op tour operators, more housing, and it goes on. More staff will be needed in retail establishments and restaurants. Obviously, more restaurants will be needed and retail outlets. Hundreds of construction jobs will be available during the build-out. Hundreds of construction jobs. And there's nobody in this room that doesn't know who McAlpine is. I think that's great comfort to know that a local company will be providing those jobs. Students coming out of school will have opportunities to join businesses that are growing because of the cruise industry thriving and providing those opportunities. This is the type of activity that helps build our economy, makes it sustainable, and keeps it growing. I would like to say that the selection of the preferred bidder represents a significant step forward to achieving our commitment to provide this country with a modern cruise berthing and enhanced cargo facility that caters to the essential needs of the country. The evolution of the mega ship has changed the face of cruising in the Caribbean, and we are faced with the choice of either preparing to enhance this reality or accepting that we will be left behind. After 40 years of being in the cruise tourism business, Cayman is distinct within the region for not having a berthing facility. Rather than being an attribute, this presents a serious risk and will ultimately place our cruise tourism industry in jeopardy and risk. The cruise lines are our customers as well as our industry partners, and it is in our country's long-term best interest to provide a berthing facility that will positively impact employment and ultimately inject hundreds of millions of dollars into our economy. Now that the preferred bidder has been announced, I'm pleased that we have the opportunity to address the misinformation that opponents to this project have deliberately circulated to cause fear and confusion in the minds of the public. China Harbor, simply put, is not the preferred bidder. The cost of the project is around 200 million, not three to four hundred million. The fact is government is not providing any loans, bonds, or guarantees for this project. There will be no upland development. The berthing facility and cargo port will not be given over to any third party for the next 25 years. It will still be managed and run by the Cayman Islands Port Authority just as it is today. And Port Authority has a 95% rate of Caymanians working there. As the Port Authority grows, the employment percentage will get more Caymanians and stay the same. 
the birthing facility will not cause flooding in Georgetown. I look forward to questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Colonel. Mr. Bodden. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. What I'm going to do this afternoon is uh, provide some more detail from on from Honorable Premier, Honorable Deputy Premier. As Honorable Premier said, we started the procurement process in May 2017 with the pre-qualification. That pre-qualification resulted in 11 submissions being received. Nine of those 11 were invited to submit outline solutions in November 2017. The deadline for submission of those outline solutions was the 16th of March 2018. Five submissions were received. On the 30th of no November 2018, the top three of the five that were that were received with the invitation to submit outline solutions were invited to submit final tenders. As we've all heard, the deadline for the final submissions was the 31st of May 2019 and one bid was received. The, bids, the bid was evaluated on the following criteria, financial, technical, risk management, environmental, legal, and price. I believe uh, Premier spoke to that um, in the Legislative Assembly as well. The sole bidder received a pass on all the pass-fail criteria. On the assessment portion of the ISFD, Invitation to Submit Final Tender, the score received was 78.18 out of 100, and it was notable that their financial and technical sections were comprehensive and detailed. As we've heard already this afternoon, the preferred bidder Selected was Verdant Isle Port Partners, McAlpine Limited, Orion Marine Construction Incorporated, Carnival Corporation, and Royal Caribbean Cruises Limited. The consortium project will be financed by a 60-40 debt to equity ratio, and the financing will be provided by First Caribbean International Bank Cayman Limited as lead arranger. The concept design, which we've seen on a, on a prior slide, as we've, seen, as we've said before, two berths, uh, sorry, two pairs, four berths, space for people management, visitor management, ground transport management. The middle of the concept design, you'll see what will be the retail that is put back. The, this concept takes out the existing Royal Watler Cruise Terminal that's by the road and needed for access to the facility and put down the middle. The existing port building remains to, your, uh, to the far left and the port on the cargo side receives a third berth that, well, that isn't occupied in this, in this slide. Um, as one crew uh, sorry, one cargo ship, another cargo ship, and another slot to the right. The concept also provides for tendering as well, as you see to the far right, where you see the four smaller tender tender boats, and of course the four cruise ships at berth at the two pairs. This next slide is just the uh, artist rendering of the pedestrian view in the retail area with the cruise ships in the background at birth. And this, this slide again was alluded to prior where the piers sit on pilings. And this, this, we'll spend some time on this. So, the, just to explain what we're seeing, the, the brown to the bottom is to represent the sea floor. The, the green, uh, blue is the water, and the more gray is the deck of the pier. So you have the four pilings that will 
the deck will sit on top of. So there's nothing solid. They, the pilings go down a significant depth into the, into the seabed in order to support the, the deck that goes on top. The preferred bidder put forward a financing model as the my the two speakers before stated. So currently the per passenger fee, there's three fees that are collected on behalf uh, for by government. There's a departure tax called Cayman Islands government, the Port Authority, the Cayman Islands has a port fee of $3, these are in US, and the environmental protection fee charges uh, a fee as well in terms of whether the vessel is year-round or seasonal. In terms of the year-round total, these three would add up to 12.27 US, approximately 10 CI. The model proposes that the Cayman Islands government departure tax would be five US. The Port Authority fee would remain as three dollars and the environmental protection fund fee would remain as well as a dollar ninety five and three ninety. Project Co, now the preferred bidder of Verdant Isle Port Partners for year round vessels would receive eight dollars and five cents and for seasonal vessels would add up to <coughs> would would amount to six dollars and ten cents, the total being eighteen dollars year round. Sorry for the as the the total. The, it would be somewhat different for the seasonal vessels. This eighteen dollars will be indexed at two and a half percent per year. As well, the next slide, please. They come. Sorry, sir. Go do that. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, if we could go back one slide, please. So the Honorable Premier just asked me to point out that on the current amount uh, column, the estimated amount um, from that is collected in from the tender vessels that they charge in order to <coughs> from uh, ship to shore to transfer the passengers is approximately five dollars as well. So that that comes out to I think it's actually five twenty five. So that comes out to seven I think it's seventeen fifty two roughly US US dollars. Premier? That's what you want to point out. Okay. So the compliant bid. The compliant bid was two twenty nine point zero six six CI dollars. Two there are two value proposals as well. I think uh, Premier alluded to that in, the, in his presentation, in his, in his remarks, that alternative option one is 207.908 million and alternative option two, 196.529 million. The, the government guidance and decision on this was to proceed with option two, which is reflected in the scope of the artist's rendering that we've seen that we've seen before. Next steps, there's the finalization of reserve matters with the preferred bidder, the recommencement of the EIA process, the drafting of an early works agreement. There'll be a caucus presentation on the contract award and a cabinet consideration of that contract award. I think uh, Honorable Premier spoke to this already that, that that would not be before certain steps are taken that he, he will also that he will also speak to. I'm sure there's lots of questions, but we will get to those at the end after Premier um, makes his additional remarks. A public consultation in there for the environment. Yes, sir. So the, the recommencement of the EIA. Thank you, Chief Officer Barton. <coughs> Honorable Premier. Thank you. Let me now move to discuss briefly the matter of a people-initiated referendum. 
I want to first note for anyone who is not aware of it that a people-initiated referendum is made possible by Section 70 of the Cayman Islands Constitution because it was part of the Progressives' constitutional proposals in the 10 years of negotiations with the UK leading up to the 2009 Constitution order. It was me and my progressive colleagues who fought to have this included in the 2009 Constitution. Because of my direct involvement, I know very well what was intended by the language in the Constitution. Specifically, Section 70 of the Constitution states in part that, quote, before a referendum under this section may be held, there shall be presented to the Cabinet a petition signed by not less than 25% of persons registered registered as electors in accordance with Section 90, unquote. The intention was exactly as stated. The test was to be not less than 25% of registered electors. Not 24%, not uh, signatures who are not registered electors, but not less than 25% of registered electors. And the only way one can validate whether the test of not less than 25% is truly met is to validate every signature. We are small enough in terms of the number of registered voters and have the ability to carry out this necessary verification to conform to the requirements of the Constitution. Undoubtedly, despite the early noise, this is proving true with no issues and with no interference or intimidation, as some have proffered, would be inevitable in this process. My government respects the provisions in the Constitution. And most importantly, we respect the people of the Cayman Islands who have signed the petition for a referendum. And so, I will again repeat what I said on Friday. Notwithstanding Cabinet's approval of the preferred bidder, the government will not proceed to execute a contract before the 1st of October 2019 in order to allow for the completion of the people-initiated petition verification of signature process. Despite the unfounded accusations, at no point have we interfered with the process, and this will continue to be the way we operate. I can also confirm to the public that there is absolutely no truth in the reporting by CNS on Friday that, quote, it has become increasingly apparent in recent weeks that it is the government's intention to challenge the call for a people's vote in the courts, unquote. It is absolutely untrue. I really do despair at these tactics, but I do believe that the public is coming to see through it all and to understand that the real intent is to sow suspicion and discord and to do anything and everything possible to stop the project from proceeding by fair means or by foul. I have always been of the view that the vast majority of people in these islands have for decades supported cruise berthing as well as the need for improving our current very old cargo dock facilities. Now that we are in a position to provide the information we promised, I have no doubt that even should we go to a referendum, that it will be won overwhelming, overwhelmingly in favor of us completing the project and placing our islands in the best possible position to maintain and grow an important part of our economy. The announcement we have made today demonstrates that the project is delivering on the promises we made to the country. Cayman's new port will deliver jobs and income for Caymanian families. The project will be delivered by a trusted developer and partners. The project is proceeding because we have secured an excellent funding arrangement. 
their current proposed design minimizes the impact on the environment and the project has followed and will continue to follow best practice in procurement and delivery. Thank you, gentlemen. We'd like to now open the floor up for any questions from members of the media. Sienas? Thank you. Um, can I just confirm that you will not be legally challenging the petition if it comes out? And are you ready yet to give us the question that you would want to see? As it seems, as 67%, I think, today is, is verified. Or is it too early? Oh, so can you say that you do agree now that it is a matter of national importance, which you'd refused to say in the LA a few weeks ago? No, I'm not. Oh, I've I'm got not, more questions. I'm, I'm not saying on. any of those things. I have said what I intend to say about that aspect of it. Okay. Any, right any more questions? Can you just uh, walk us through in a bit more detail the financing arrangement? Um, I just want to understand. So, uh, what what aspect of it? Yeah. So, from the slide, uh, I take it is sort of at eight dollars, somewhere between six and eight dollars per passenger is what the project partners are taking. Back to the slide. Sorry. So we'll just get the slide put back up, James. Yep. So yeah. Um, so the project partners are putting in 200 million, is that correct? And, the, and their return on that is six to eight dollars per passenger? Correct. Okay, um, so that's expected to yield about 16 million a year if you get, if you get two million passengers. Okay. How does that uh, interact with the separate funding from the other cruise partners? Okay, so. Good question. Yep. <coughs> When when we are going out to RFP, the government was not going to put forward any money, any guarantee, any bonds, as, as Premier and Deputy Premier said before. So we had to put forward a payback mechanism. The cruise lines came and said, whoever would be preferred bidder, project co, they were prepared to extend financing to. Yeah? That was an option yeah, that they could take. We had to provide that to them. The preferred bidder has opted not to take that finance and have their 60-40 split, as we have said earlier. OK, so Disney and those others are not, are not involved in any finance in, anymore, then? That was, that's off the table. No, so their, their commitment reverts to them coming and them being involved in paying as everybody else has paid. And the 60-40 thing, just to explain that again, sorry. So 60-40, so, so if, if we go back to that slide, please. Before, before he, um, Strand goes into that detail, what we have, or what was provided to us, uh, which totaled $180 million, were letters of intent. So as, as Strand has said, when the tender package went out, we were able to say to everybody, who wanted to bid? If you, if you uh, wish to, this is an indication of the level of financing which these cruise companies are prepared to put up. Because as as Ryan said, we have we had to put in place a a mechanism of funding this this project as part of the of the overall tender process. So what has happened now is that two of those cruise lines have partnered with Orion and with McAlpine and have said, this is the way we propose to, to finance this project. Uh, we are going to put up 40% equity ourselves and we're going to borrow the other 60% through First Caribbean as lead arranger. So the letters of intent were not, were not taken up. But what has been taken up is the, the continued involvement of the other two crews, MSC and Disney, as who will have preferential birthing, birthing rights at, at the facility. So, James, you finish? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, 
let me see if I can make it a little clearer, right? Um, this is a company now, Bird and Isle, and, and they are going to build the cruise berthing. How are they going to get paid back? For every passenger that comes here, whether they're brought by Disney, MSC, Norwegian, Carnival, or Royal, they're going to pay $18 a head. And they're going to pay that $18 to the Port Authority of the Cayman Islands. And the Port Authority of the Cayman Islands is going to divide that money and pay it out as respected on the slide. So I, I, I think it's the flow that you're trying to understand of, of what happens with the money. And uh, just looking again at that slide, it, so the amount that the government's going to take is, is a little less per passenger? Um, like $2, it, two it, it, it is less on that slide, but when you increase the volume of the number of passengers, your net is going to be more for the government. So what you're hoping basically is that the, the increased number of passengers will cover any, right. any shortfall in the per passenger rate? Additionally, so... The five dollars applies to the option, the, the highest option, the two twenty nine option. The government has has said to go forward with the one ninety six option, so that five dollars would actually increase as well. Okay, okay, and and, uh, and their their amounts would would come down. Sorry, the f the five dollars might would increase, increase a little bit. The, the five dollars there more. U.S. would applies to the two twenty nine bid. The government has has said to go forward with the alternative option two, which is one ninety six million, one ninety six point five two nine million. So the value the value for the bidder is that when, after about fifteen years or so, based on based on my maths just now, <laughs> that they start making pure profit from 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 this for for ten years. Which there'd be a mechanism for division for government to participate in, depending on the pass through of passengers. So. So the, the, the contract will include a provision to avoid a super profit by the by the um, cruise lines by the cruise, by the cruise by yeah by Verdant. Verdant. Verdant, the, uh, Verdant Isle. Uh, so when when the numbers get to a certain point, they have to share any profit with the with the government. What's that threshold? Do you, do you know? Being negotiated. That's that's part of the the detail that has to be worked out over over the, um, the contract negotiations. Okay, okay. Uh, and just one more quick question in terms of <coughs> the referendum. I don't know if you are, are you able to say that if you do get those number if they do get those numbers that you would support a referendum or is is that something that's still to be determined? Uh, absolutely. I said we we respect the constitution. Uh, if they if they do get the numbers then. Then we'll have a referendum. Sooner the better. Okay, I, I just hadn't heard that said quite that explicitly mm. before. Appreciate the answer. Anyone else James, have a question? The, the, James, there's more to the picture than meets the eye. The original petition uh, that was was submitted, or list of signatures that was submitted, and then the second one contained more than 640 names that were either not registered voters or duplicates and triplicates of signature. So for those who believe that the government is somehow being cute in insisting on accreditation process, I will say this. Again, the government respects the Constitution. I'm not so sure that those who lead the, um, the CPR have um, the same sort of ethical approach to this process. Sorry, so more than 600 signatures have been discounted then at this point? Yes, sir. Okay. But they're, they're still, they're, they've still submitted a, um, a, a significant buffer above the required number, but all of those have not yet been verified. I think we're up to like 6 to 4%. And I'm, and I'm, when, I, when I talk about the ones discounted, I'm not talking about those where they went around and people refused to verify. Those numbers are relatively small. I'm talking about the, the list of names that were submitted, which were taken out before we got down to that particular number. Are you surprised, though, at the amount of names that have been verified? I mean, the, before this happened, I guess I think that a lot of people maybe thought that they wouldn't get quite this many. Almost well, I, 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 I actually know I'm, it's the other way around. I, I am surprised that 600 and uh, more than 700, if you add the, 
those who have, you know, sort of said, no, I'm, I, I was misled into it. If you add those along with the, the ones that were kicked out at the beginning, that more than 700 people would have signed um, a, peti a petition knowing that either they weren't qualified to do so or that they would then change their mind about it. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, can we get some uh, verification on these figures that you're suggesting? Let's call elections office. The ones, the, the 600, 700, what, what is that? Because there's been 20-something 20, 20 people that refuse to verify. And Those are not the ones. The petitioners themselves actually didn't hand in the ones that they themselves felt were I'm, duplicates. I'm afraid they did. So I'm just wondering if you can provide these figures, I, that's all. I think it'd be best to ask the election Okay, office, we'll, we'll ask the Because that's whom I asked and who gave me the report. Can I d ask a question about the, uh, the EIA and the uh, geothermal studies, things like that? A few, t like the DOE has said a couple of times that we really need to have geothermal studies done. So presumably now Verdant Isle will be responsible for that. Will, do you know whether that's going to be part of the wider consultation process that will happen for the EIA or whether it's going to be something separate? Can you just give us a bit of information about how that will happen because it's obviously important for the engineering? I think the good news is that um, Beard, um, who was the original company that did the environmental impact assessment, has been retained by Verdant. Um, the, as you saw earlier and was in my remarks, the actual footprint that is proposed is smaller than the original footprint. The dredging is less, the coral relocation is less, and the environmental impact assessment was done. Um, the Department of Environment has been extremely helpful. Um, they have the environmental committee, which will, after the scoping work is done, will have a look at this and make all the um, input and run the assessment of the environmental impact that's needed for moving forward. The geotechnical studies, they're like whether you can drill into the rock. Do you know what, what's happening about that? Don't. Yes, sir. Uh, Wendy, if you'd like to repeat the question for us on mic, please. Yep. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry, I was just asking for some, <laughs> some clarification about the geotechnical studies, which is a separate and apart really from the EIA, but they actually yeah. indicate the engineering of it. Yeah, so if we go back to that slide of the next steps, it's really on there. So, yep, yeah. so basically we've got there, recommence the EIA process and the early works agreement. So now we've selected a preferred bidder, our next steps are really to submit a coastal works application to do a geotechnical investigation. Now that's twofold. It's a geotechnical investigation to verify the conditions for the piers. It's also a geotechnical investigation of the coral relocation site to make sure that when we relocate the corals, we can anchor them down to the seabed. So that's the first part. The next part, as Deputy Premier said, is that the, the consortium's team members, their environmental consultant, are Baird, the same environmental consultant from 2015, and their coral relocation subcontractor is a company called Polaris. Now, Polaris have done a lot of work in Georgetown Harbour, particularly with anchor damage at Eden Rock. So the process now is we submit for a coastal works application for the geotech, for the coral relocation, and to do the geotechnical work. The preferred bit of it has to submit to the Environmental Assessment Board their proposed environmental consultant, who is Baird. We then have to do a scoping update to demonstrate the differences between the Baird 2015 EI and the current proposal. And as Deputy Premier said, that's all submitted to the Environmental Assessment Board, who will then take that into consideration and then guide us really on the next steps. And that all falls in what we call the early works agreement. Okay. Mr. Premier, um, we've heard a lot about the money and you know the steps and, and all that. Um, but looking at the design, looking at how it will change the scope of Georgetown, how do you feel about what it looks like and how do you think it will impact sort of the way we feel about the Georgetown Harbor area? I think it's I think it's going to be a massive improvement on the present arrangement there. Anyone who goes there during peak cruise ship days will will know. Uh, most Caymanians try to avoid the area unless they're actually engaged in in in, in taxi or tour business uh, because it is just um, it's just quite chaotic. Uh, this is going to give us a greater ability to manage the, the flow of of passengers. Um, it's going to make life so much 
easier and nicer for the for the cruise visitors themselves. They can actually walk off the ship rather than to be tendered. And uh, I think it's going to be um, an in, an incredible um, improvement over what we currently have now. There's a reason why every other jurisdiction in the Caribbean and Central America, besides the Cayman Islands, have cruise berthing facilities. You know. It also ties hand in hand with the revitalization of Georgetown. It, it will be the anchor for Georgetown's revitalization. And one, one of the, one of the um, I think, hu huge wins for us, which no other jurisdiction has managed to secure, is that there is no upland development by the cruise companies. Nothing. Uh, so the, the business that we have, businesses that have built them, um, themselves up and developed over the course of the last 50 years, um, almost 50 years now since Cayman has been in the cruise business on a regular basis, um, will continue to get the benefit, in fact, improved benefit of the um, cruise ship traffic through, through their businesses. We aren't allowing the building of the, the tourist traps, um, which are, exist in a number of other jurisdictions, which are, are owned and controlled by the cruise companies, so that the passengers you know, filter through there before they actually get into the, the local um, economy or start to impact the local economy. So we've we've avoided that, and uh, there's a reason why this this deal has taken so long to reach. It is the, the product of a great deal of of um, negotiation over a long period of time by some very smart people, and I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> Good afternoon, Premier. I'd like to know first of all, um, Vernon Isle, what's their position if this referendum is in fact triggered? Have they given you any undertaking that they will wait until that process is completed? How is that going to work out? Yes, they're prepared to wait until this is done because we're not executing a contract until this that's done. Okay, um, you took one of my questions. I was just about to ask you, how difficult was it to get this company to agree to no upland development because that's that was one of the biggest sticking points, um, having this process going on for so many years. <laughs> it was incredibly difficult. And as I say, I, I don't take a great deal of, of credit for that. We, we just stuck to our guns, quite frankly, um, because we, we have had the benefit, and the Deputy Premier, Premier myself, and, and many others around this table have traveled to other <laughs> jurisdictions to look at how they're their ports operate um, to see the good, the bad, and the ugly, and to, and with the benefit of that experience, been able to make judgments about yeah. about what's best for for Cayman. Uh, Rash, we tagged in. You know, there's a life cycle to every product, and the life cycle to the tourist um, cruise tourism industry for Grand Cayman is mature. So when you look at some of our competitors in the region, they had a, a, a less than mature product offering, which allowed the cruise lines the opportunity to go in and say, we would like to do upland development. We made it very clear from the start that our upland development was already built. We used to use the phrase that we're not going to allow them to come to build a, a shopping mall before their passengers get to Grand Cayman. They're going to have to get off the ship and come to Grand Cayman. They're not going to get stopped. So I think that, along with some of the other attractions that Cayman offers, um, allowed us to, to do a couple of very special things. Number one, the financing arrangement is extremely special, um, not common in the industry at all. The upland development is not common in the industry. So I believe at this point um, we're very pleased with, with the track that we're on. Thank you for that. Um, I noticed in your design, and you pointed it out, that the Royal Watler building is no longer there. What's going to happen to the tenants from that building? How are you going to incorporate them into the facility, or what's going to happen with them? The, the square footage is what is guaranteed. So the square footage that's there now is, is a Port Authority um, asset, and the rent that is paid is given paid into the Port Authority. That will not be used to to pay back the arriving and the Verdant Isle Company. Um, we have a process that, that was um, successful with the airport, with um, the concessions that we had there. Um, 
we have not decided because it'll be the board um, that will decide but what we have made very clear that we want to make sure that the tenants that are there now are protected and and look at how they continue to have success as entrepreneurs and as business people involved in the cruise tourism industry. Any more questions? CNS? Sorry, this is my final one. Um, can you give us some details about how we're going to manage the whole construction process and at the same time keep the port open? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, as part of the evaluation process, uh, it really went on from the end of November through to the end of May. <coughs> we had successful meetings with bidders. One of them was specifically about phasing and how they're going to do the project. And that was attended by, by Mr. Will Jacobs, Mr. Joseph Woods. So before the bids came in, we had to ensure that the way the contractors were proposing to build a project was workable from the port's perspective. So in effect, what happens, just to go through it in, in rough detail, is we build a new tender pier north of Royal Watler, which then allows all the tender boats to, to be berthed. We then move down into the cargo yard and then progressively build the upland. So the criteria we've got for the cargo yard is at no point during the construction process, which is about two and a half years, can the cargo facility ever be reduced in size? Yeah. So we can actually, in the future, release these phasing plans. So it's basically nine phases, which ensures that the cargo facility in particular is not disrupted. Okay. Uh, we'll have one final question. Do you have a targeted um, start date for construction, and do you have a reserve start date if there's a referendum? Well. It, the reason why we have we have said first of October is because they, they don't believe that they're going to complete the verification process much before about the middle of September. So that's and we would we would move to have the, the referendum very quickly after, as quickly as the process would allow thereafter, assuming that the verification process results in the number the minimum number of um, registered voters. So Starting before the end of the year. When's the earliest you think you could actually start um, construction on the <coughs> I can't answer that. Some, somebody else will. I could just say that we obviously have to go through the permitting process first. So it's something that we can't actually physically say because we have to approach the Environmental Assessment Board, submit plans, do our geotech. So as the as Premier said, it'll be at some point next year, but we couldn't give an exact date for a start. Yeah. Likely at some point next year. Okay. If you want my guess, just just based on 19 years of dealing with government, um, I would say probably not before the middle of next year. Construction. Okay. That's just a guess. Sure. <laughs> uh, any more questions from the floor? Any more further remarks from our panelists? Just want to thank everyone for coming and for, for the questions. I hope that uh, this helps. I say dispel many of the much of the speculation and um, has provided you with the detail you need. If there is anything additional you need if, um, in terms of facts when you're writing your stories, please don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, thank you, panelists, and thank you, media, for being here with us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.